Good morning once again, ladies and gentlemen. This session uh, is the session on uh, the uh, so-called horizontal issues in uh, Cluster 4 of Horizon Europe. And in fact, it is dedicated to the numerous synergies between Cluster 4 and other EU programs. Um, and uh, it's going to be a very rich presentation. Uh, we will allow uh, enough time at the end for questions. Uh, and you can see now the Slido uh, code, the QR code, where you can enter Slido and uh, enter your questions. Um, now, this is going to be uh, a rich presentation. There are uh, slides on several different programs. Uh, several of those slides are quite complex. And of course, we will not uh, be able to go over all the details of each program in this presentation, but uh, my colleagues will do their best to give you an outline of each program with emphasis on the opportunities that you as participants in Horizon Europe and Cluster 4 will have on top of Horizon Europe. Uh, and we will try to take as many questions as possible in uh, about half an hour to 45 minutes at the end. And then of course, uh, uh, we will share the slides uh, and we will also uh, endeavor to deal with unanswered questions uh, in writing through frequently asked questions or in some cases in the other sessions of the InfoBase of Cluster 4. And with that, I hand over to our first speaker, Max Steyer, who will begin to introduce us to the, the general concept of synergies. Max, the floor is yours. Many thanks, Nicolas. Um, many thanks to all um, who are listening. Um, yes, I tried to give you a very brief introduction on that. What uh, we have in mind when talking and thinking about synergies with Horizon Europe and try to focus it a little bit on um, Cluster 4. So um, as Nicolas said, we have a selection of uh, special program relations between Horizon Europe um, to uh, say um, and to present to you what um, is in the focus when uh, looking on cluster four. Um, so we have the, the of course, uh, the cohesion policy funds, the digital Europe program, the European space program, single market program, and the European defense fund um, will be touched a little bit. In general, our understanding of synergies is um, going beyond, or uh, let's say um, the other way around, not only looking uh, how can we put funds together, but talking in pictures. Of course, funding is necessary. Funding is um, the fuel of acting, of creating impact. Uh, that is clear. Without money, uh, it goes nothing, but money is not all, but it's not an objective in itself. Strategy is key, having the strategy first and then looking for the money. So funding is the fuel, strategy is the engine to keep the system running and to create impact. And that's our main aim. On the next slide, thank you. You see the context I mentioned, uh, just mentioned the programs uh, or the program relations. The legal background is the regulation of Horizon Europe. And there uh, you have for the first time in a European um, framework program, a real legal and policy base, which describes the re relations between the framework program and the other respective programs. In this case, marked yellow, uh, we have a special focus when looking on cluster four. It's uh, the content on the, on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, you see how, uh, we see our homeworks uh, as the commission clearly also together with the member states to enhance synergies in terms of compatibility, alignment of the, the governments on the top and on the, at the bottom you see coherence and complementarity, meaning by contents and topics setting uh, um, a streamlined uh, strategic pr priorities to support a common vision um, will go the uh, political gui guidelines uh, of the European commissions at all. On the following slide, uh, we see it from a different angle and see, okay, um, synergies have always been happening. 
uh, by chance, more or less, by design. What we are aiming is really creating synergies by design. And in the bubbles, uh, you see what we identified as uh, the recipe, if you want um, um, the, the different ingredients, which are necessary, um, independent from the program, from a certain content or topic, what you need to create synergies, not only, again, in terms of money, but in terms of quality when um, bringing uh, tasks in one project together or combine different actions or projects uh, sequentially or in parallel. I um, want to focus on the two left bubbles, um, uh, not go through all, but to see, okay, the pathway from research to deployment is crucial to create impact. Uh, and secondly, the education and skills, because in the following part, we will um, go uh, into the European Social Fund and the Cohesion Fund. So on the next slide, um, uh, you see the points into more detail, what we have in mind when thinking about the pathway from research to deployment, clearly not limiting the whole action or the whole package on um, research. Research is not an objective in itself or not the own purpose um, of innovation, that's clear. So we have to think about policy making, demonstration, creating and fostering infrastructures and facilities for development. Uh, and uh, of course, also bringing uh, the results to the market um, by uh, private or public innovation procurement and uh, to, to see how we, we combine this and the, with the other programs which, which, will you see, which you will see in the following presentations. And the next slide uh, shows you how education and skills are very crucial not to only generate IP, and uh, inventions, but for real innovations, it is clear that you have to address and have to enable by education and skills, the citizens, the researchers themselves, um, the students very early, workers and employees in different sectors um, in the production field, as well as in the health sectors, and of course, the decision makers and all uh, who deal in the public sectors, with, um, with uh, the new issues which come into the world. On the next two slides, I prepared to make it really concrete some uh, or two examples, what we identified in the past for synergies, what we have in mind for synergies by design, how to create the first one is in the field of hydrogen and the second one in the field of uh, telemedicine and um, issues. I uh, want to encourage uh, to you um, to, to have a closer look on this and um, get back with any question at the end. That's just to introduce to you briefly our general concept. And uh, we are now getting into the um, presentation to the structural funds. And I'm very, very happy to you um, to, to hand over to Carolina Tillmann. Many thanks. Thank you, uh, Max. Uh, good morning to all the participants. I'm joining this event from the uh, DG Regional and Urban Policy of the uh, European Commission. And while explaining the synergies uh, from the point of view of the cohesion policy and in particular European Regional Development Fund, I'd like to underline that while Horizon naturally focuses on supporting excellent research and innovation under its uh, many angles, the cohesion policy, in line with the Article 174 of, of the treaty, focuses on decreasing regional disparities and on industrial transition. And in order to do that, it addresses challenges and bottlenecks in a wide range of areas, depending on the needs of the relevant um, regions, and also in line with the current commission priorities of, 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 of the green and digital transformation. The research and innovation are, are, are seen as domains with a, with a particular potential to reduce uh, regional disparities. And this is actually where uh, the interests of, of both uh, policies uh, meet. And the support from, from, from the ERDF for the 2021-2027 programming period will be split among five large uh, policy objectives, which aim at addressing uh, regional disparities. And namely, it is Europe that is smarter, greener, more connected, more social, and, and closer to the citizen. 
uh, it is still the, the previous slide, thank you. This uh, support will be covered by the budget of, of uh, 217 billion uh, for ERDF as, as agreed um, in the negotiations. And here I'd like to pass the floor to Lyubomira Derelieva from um, DG Employment of the European Commission. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carolina, and uh, good morning for me as well. I will uh, present to you today the European Social Fund Plus, which is uh, the second fund the start of the cohesion policy today and the ESF plan fund for investing in people in uh, the 2021-2027 period. It will have uh, a budget of uh, just over 99 uh, billion euro and uh, most of that would be implemented through shared management just uh, as, uh, as the ERDF and we'll look in more details uh, at uh, what that means uh, later. But uh, there will also be dedicated resources to transnational projects uh, and uh, a dedicated strand to employment and social innovation that uh, have um, that is directly managed uh, by the Commission. Now, this is a brief uh, overview of the two funds. I pass uh, the floor back to Carolina to look at the cohesion policy objectives. Next slide, please, if we may. Thank you. Um, so in the um, future co co cohesion policy programs um, um, and uh, European Regional Development Fund in particular, research and innovation is supported by the uh, policy objective one, one of the five policy objectives. Policy objective one is a more competitive and smarter Europe. This policy objective focuses on the innovation applied research, on bringing research results onto the market, on the close business science uh, cooperation and, and uh, deployment. So, so seeing the results uh, of uh, research um, uh, uh, tapping into the real economy. There's also a strong focus on uh, digitization, SME competitiveness and, and, and skills, skills for uh, smart specialization. So within the policy objective one, ERDF supports uh, projects of uh, regional relevance that are based on place-based smart specialization strategies. These are the strategies where regions, member states uh, define themselves, their priorities based on, on their, their inherent strengths. Um, they also constitute uh, the so-called enabling condition for the policy objective one. So an entry criteria to tap into the uh, ERDF uh, funding that create the preconditions. Um, to a large extent, uh, ERDF policy objective one funds mono beneficiaries with an em emphasis on diffusion of innovation and on the technology and innovation ecosystem uh, development. And again, I'm passing the floor um, to Yuba. Thank you, Carolina. The second policy objective of uh, cohesion policy that is relevant uh, to us today is a so-called policy objective four, which is a more social and inclusive Europe. And it covers uh, three main policy areas, employment, social inclusion, but also education and training that we're looking at uh, more closely today. And in the area of education and training here on the slide, you can see a few examples of what cohesion policy can support. Um, in, in the next programming period. So this can be support to systems or reforms in the sector or um, concrete upskilling and upskilling uh, projects uh, can also be capacity building or career support for, for teachers or trainers or researchers. It can also be um, enhancing the labor market relevance of higher education or creating partnerships uh, between different institutions, higher education, business research, or as well uh, supporting infrastructure and equipment uh, for education and training. And both the ERDF and the ESF Plus will, will contribute to this policy objective, but uh, the ERDF has a more, more of a focus on infrastructure and equipment, whereas the ESF Plus will support rather the, the soft, uh, so-called soft uh, measures um, that, uh, that we just saw. These examples. And now uh, Carolina will tell you a bit more in, in, in a bit more detail about the ERDF. Next slide, please. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, so actually bringing the cohesion policy and the horizon investments closer together was, was, was high on the cohesion policy agenda over the past years. And um, well, efforts have accelerated with the preparation of the, of the current programming period with the uh, regulatory frameworks on both sides, allowing for, for extended possibilities in this respect. Still, the primary uh, objective, as, as already mentioned, is, is strategic as complementarities could strengthen the impact of both policies, and in particular in less developed and peripheral regions, which is very important for closing the innovation divide, the persistent innovation divide um, across, across Europe. For synergies with the cohesion policy, for, with the ERDF, these are the smart specialization strategies that act as the organizing principle from our point of view. And the investments implemented in synergies uh, with Horizon need to respect the scope of the ERDF and, and be in line, um, contribute to its specific objectives. So synergies with, with other instruments uh, are about seeking a strategic alignment for better complementarity and impact on the respective objectives, not about, but they are not about pooling or, or replacing the, the uh, respective uh, funds. Um, and here I'm passing the floor to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina. If we could uh, look at the next slide, please. Thank you. Now in more detail about the ESF plus and what it uh, and how it can support skills. Firstly, why are we talking about skills in Horizon Europe cluster four? As Max already mentioned, they are key for achieving um, Europe's industrial leadership and increased autonomy in strategic value chains. At the same time, numerous research projects show that uh, there are uh, challenges in relation to, to skill shortages and there is a need for, for upskilling and reskilling. A few examples of, uh, of where DSF Plus can come uh, in this respect um, in its scope. These are not exhaustive, these are just examples to illustrate DSF Plus can uh, can support uh, developing or deploying innovative cur curricula or teaching methods or uh, technologies for education and training courses. For example, such courses can be trainings for production or deployment of new products or services or processes. The fund can also support uh, bringing together in partnerships uh, different uh, stakeholders like higher education, business and research organizations to identify skills needs or, or, or how skills gaps can be addressed. And then this, the fund can also support individual uh, teachers or, or researchers or, or trainers and, and students. And uh, in the area of, uh, of skills uh, and education, the fund has three main specific objectives. One is to improve the quality of education training system. The second is uh, to promote equal access. And thirdly, of uh, great relevance to, to us today is uh, to promote lifelong learning and uh, reskilling and uh, upskilling. And in all these areas, uh, the ESF Plus will also promote social innovation in all member states. Now we looked at uh, the, the two cohesion uh, policy funds that, uh, that are part of the presentation today uh, at, and their objectives. Let's have a look a bit at the mechanics of how they work. If we could move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. As uh, we already mentioned, the ERDF and the ESF plus as part of cohesion policy are implemented through shared management. For those of you who are not so familiar with how shared management works, a quick recap. Shared management uh, means that management is shared, as the name suggests, between the commission and the member states. And here on the left, you can see the, the division of uh, responsibilities. And um, at the beginning of each uh, programming period of each new EU budget, as we are currently uh, at the beginning of the 2021-2027 period, the Commission member states negotiate the new programs. This is a process called programming, and it uh, involves um, agreeing on the priorities for investment, what the budget would be, what the actions uh, would be for the next seven years. And once these uh, programs have been agreed and adopted, 
uh, we expect uh, for the majority of the ERDF and ESF plus programs uh, for this process to be concluded by the end of the this year. So the new programs will be operational by then. And uh, once this process is concluded, then the commission on the left, you can see the responsibilities uh, involve uh, monitoring implementation, reimbursing expenditure to the member state and uh, the commission is ultimately accountable for the budget. Whereas, uh, perhaps more importantly for you, as uh, potential beneficiaries, the member states, which can be at national or regional level, are responsible for delivering the planned action, selecting the concrete project, paying the project organizer. So it is the national and or regional authorities in charge of implementing ERDF and ESF plus that are the contact point for, for projects. Two important uh, principles of shared management that are worth mentioning are that of partnership and co-financing. Partnership means that uh, the decision-making is joint, not just between the European Commission member states, but also that uh, all relevant civil society and social partners are, are involved in, in all stages of the programming, implementation, monitoring of the funds. And with regard to co-financing, this means that uh, the EU that the, the resources that uh, come from the EU are complemented by national co-financing. So the amounts we saw at the beginning uh, are just the EU amount and then member states would also contribute uh, additional resources uh, to, to top these up. This, uh, this is an overview of how a shared management works. And now I pass the floor on to Peter to, to look into more details at synergies between Horizon Europe and cohesion policy. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So um, when we talk about synergies, we have to we have to look at different levels of synergies. Um, in the following slides, we will um, concentrate a bit on looking at the specific provisions that are new in the regulation. But it's not only about um, the provisions and the mechanics, but we um, also um, have to think about um, uh, that the fact that synergies should be part of a strategic orientation. So what do we want to get out of the synergies? Um, and then try to use the different tools from Horizon, Asian policy for their own logic of intervention, uh, but together in a strategic way. So uh, just um, uh, for the alignment and the um, strategic orientation, as you know, um, for the Horizon um, Europe program, there has been a, a long strategic planning process, a large stakeholder consultation, open to universities, companies, also managing authorities from cohesion policy regions um, to tell us what their priorities are and how they want to have it implemented. And the results you have seen in the Horizon Europe regulation and the strategic plan, and now in the work programs. On the cohesion policy side, uh, there has also, uh, there's also a programming taking place uh, at this moment. Uh, there are uh, member states and regions are developing uh, the future cohesion policy programs together with economic social partners, including from the research and the education community. And uh, in this context, it's, it's also important um, for, for this part to, to um, keep in mind uh, the key strategic orientations and impacts um, identified under Horizon Europe as a reference point for developing possible synergies. Our objective um, has been um, uh, to make sure that if member state regions find it useful to operate in synergies, that uh, that they can find find these synergies and, and implement them in an easy way, practical way. So for this, we had to build in the synergies in the rules in the relevant uh, legislation, Horizon Europe, Common Provisions Regulations, and uh, also uh, in this uh, relevant state aid rules. And for the state aid rules, I'll hand over to my colleague Bernhard um, von Wendland, who is uh, the state aid expert in RDG. Thank you, Peter. Um, we switch to the next slide. Yes, indeed. Why, why are we talking about state aid rules in this context? Uh, the reason is that um, cohesion policy funds, for instance, ERDF or the ESF Plus, they are member state resources because member states have control over these resources. And that is why they are subject to EU stated rules. And just because effective synergies require conducive rules, stated rules have to play their part in enabling synergies. 
And this is precisely what is going to happen with uh, the forthcoming amendment to the state aid general block exemption regulation. That's a regulation that uh, allows member states to grant state aid under quite easy rules for certain objectives. And there will be amendments that will allow member states to grant state aid for research and development and innovation together with Horizon Europe uh, and use their regional funds for that. And uh, I will come back with more on state aid later uh, after um, Peter has explained the areas that will benefit from these uh, uh, from synergies like the seals of excellence. Peter? Yes, thank you. So for the seal of excellence, this is the longest established synergy instrument exists since 2015. Um, what is it? It's, um, it's a quality label that shows um, that the proposal submitted uh, to a call for proposals under Horizon has exceeded all of the evaluation thresholds um, set out in the work program, but could not be funded just due to a lack of budget available for that call. And then this might, this project proposal receives a seal of excellence, a recognized label signed by the commissioners DG RNI and DG Regional Policy. And, uh, and that offers a, an alternative way for financial support. So they could turn to an ERDF program, for example, ESF program, um, to the managing authority. And um, of course, in these only in cases where this is also then might be considered where they, where they are in line with the um, cohesion program objectives and in the case of RNI investment uh, with the um, smart specialization priorities of the region. These seeds of excellence, they are indicated in the Horizon Europe work program. Uh, typically, they're um, awarded to mono beneficiaries, um, for example, the EIC, Accelerator, MSCA, ERC, Proof of Concept, Principle. Multi beneficiary support is, is not excluded, but more difficult to implement. So, what is new under the future rules for, on the seal of excellence? Um, one point uh, is that cohesion policy authorities, they can make a full and direct use of the Horizon Europe selection procedure. So um, there's no uh, need for new qualitative assessment of the RNI content. And they can apply the same uh, cost eligibility rules and maximum funding rates. So this avoids a duplication of effort um, by beneficiaries, managing authorities, when submitting, evaluating, selecting operations for cohesion policy support. Uh, yes, and with this, uh, I, I will pass on to um, Bernhard for the stated implications. Yes, uh, Peter. So, um, state aid rules, if you could just uh, quickly switch back to the previous slide on the seals of excellence. Uh, now, here, here we come back. Uh, uh, coming back to the role stated rules can play to enable synergies uh, in, in practical implementation. Because what Peter in essence explained is, how can member state replace uh, EU horizon funding with state aid? And uh, to facilitate this, uh, there will be a new rule in the forthcoming amendment to the general block exemption regulation that uh, contains some conditions for member states to, ex to precisely grant aid for projects that have received their seal of excellence. That means um, some strings are attached to it to make it in line, to bring this in line with stated rules. That means that beneficiaries can be SMEs. The maximum funding amount can be 2.5 million per project per SMEs. But uh, all other eligibility rules are those that uh, are, are applicable on the horizon. So the member state does not have to, to do in order to grant the aid to the seal of excellent project, does not have to do a new and uh, an extra assessment of eligibility. This has been done by Horizon Europe. They can just grant the aid in line with the conditions that will be set forth in the forthcoming general block exemption regulation. Um, and this, with this, I hand back to Peter. Yes, next slide, please. So uh, another novelty um, for synergies, next slide, yeah, the transfer, exactly. Another novelty for synergies is the possibility of, uh, of transfer. So uh, now it's possible to transfer up to 5% of the initial allocation of each fund under shared management, for example, fund cohesion policy, to any other instrument uh, under direct, indirect management uh, for the benefit of the member state concerned. Um, 
So uh, once what is important to, to, to uh, know is that once the transfer occurs, the rules that apply um, are the fund uh, uh, or the instrument to which the resources are transferred. So if there's a transfer from ERDF, cohesion policy to Horizon Europe, Horizon Europe rules fully apply. Up to, it's up to, as for the other um, synergy instruments, fully up to the uh, member states, regions to decide whether or not to make use of it. Of it. So if they think it's useful for, for their territory, they can make it easily. Um, there's also a possibility, in a way, a safeguard, an incentive um, to use this possibility, and that is um, for the, the possibility also to transfer back resources uh, from Horizon to the ERDF source program under certain conditions if they are not fully committed these resources under horizon europe so the advantages member states regions they can profit from the selection procedure under horizon um, companies they enjoy the same horizon europe rules uh, there's no need for member states to set up a full scheme to assess proposals and uh, for the project applicants there's the advantage that they will become a full horizon europe uh, projects, um, they will just as normal horizon projects enter the grant preparation process, will be uh, fully subject to horizon rules, including funding rates, and uh, enjoy the same um, treatment under state aid, for which I will pass back to Bernard. Yes, um, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, now here the question arises, are these funds still subject to state aid rules once they've been transferred? As I said previously, as long as a member state has control over its public funds, these funds are subject to stated rules. These are very objective rules uh, where the Commission has no discretion uh, to deviate from them. So this is the question now. Are these transferred resources still subject to stated rules? The answer is it depends. If a member state transfers these resources and does not attach any conditions to that, no longer has any discretion over the use of the funds, then they are no longer subject to stated rules. The member states cannot do any political decisions to select beneficiaries. And um, so th this is the important message here. As long as there are no conditions attached, no stated rules. If there are conditions attached, again, it may even if they are quite weak, if they are there, then stated rules would apply, and then uh, the funds would still be subject to a different set of rules, namely stated rules. That's a quite important thing to keep in mind when arranging for a transfer and to transfer conditions. Uh, Peter? Yes, uh, next slide, please. Um, now we come to a very specific case also of, of, of synergies, um, uh, and these are the teaming actions under um, the widening uh, part of Horizon. Um, Next slide. Next slide, please. Um, and here, I mean, teaming actions, um, as you might know, these are, uh, are actions under the widening part of Horizon Europe, and the objective is to create or, or modernize existing centers of excellence uh, by means of a close and strategic partnership with, uh, with um, uh, leading institutions abroad. So um, where the synergies come in is uh, in that uh, these projects need uh, complementary funding, um, national, regional, or European funding, for example, from cohesion policy programs. And uh, the total amount must at least equal the total requested Horizon Europe contribution. So it's in a way a way of a combined funding. Um, so what is new? Uh, the references uh, in the legislation, on the one hand, um, uh, Similar to what is uh, the case for the seal of excellence, there's the possibility to apply Horizon Europe rules on eligible costs, uh, activities, funding rates, and also um, uh, operations supported by the complementary source. They have to comply also, as with the seal of excellence, with the objectives, of course, of the program and the smart specialization strategy. Um, what is new is um, that there's a possibility uh, to have a joint evaluation of the activities funded by the different funding sources. So both parts, the horizon part and possibly the cohesion policy part, um, assessed um, uh, uh, in a joint evaluation, single application, single evaluation of both parts. For the state aid consequences, I pass on to Bernard. Yes, sir, Peter, thank you. And as we are a bit over time, I'll just hurry up with this. Now, again, here we are in, a, in an area that can benefit from synergies. Again, stated rules 
play their role because member states can use their cohesion policy funds uh, to co-finance teaming actions. Now, what can they do under the forthcoming new rules? First of all, they can co-fund R&D projects, research and development projects that are within a teaming action. Uh, up to the same funding intensities that are allowed by Horizon. That's so that, that's the co-funding with state aid easier under the new rules. Second thing is that uh, member states can co-fund uh, or can can provide aid for investment in teaming relevant infrastructures. For instance, research infrastructures, laboratories, test beds, and so forth. This is they can do up to a rather generous funding intensity under the new block exemption regulation, as long as this infrastructure is accessible to several users and uh, as long as uh, there are no other advantages to the users that are actually then using the infrastructure. Um, so these are new rules that again will just facilitate the granting of aid to accompany uh, teaming actions funded by Horizon. Uh, Peter? Uh, yes, um, for the... Um uh, Bernard, you you wanted to take the partnerships, or is it? Uh... Uh, oh yes, uh, yes. yes. I just carry on. Uh, just carry on with that. Yes. Uh, next slide. Now, um, quickly, um, another area that benefits from uh, synergies and that benefits then from uh, easier stated rules under the forthcoming block exemption regulation is co-funding for European partnerships. Now, um, this is where um, the financial contributions from member states. Uh, are their own contributions and um, how do we handle this under stated rules? A forthcoming rule will allow uh, funding, co-funding with state aid to projects that have been independently selected under Horizon Europe rules under multinational calls with at least three member states or at least two member states plus one associated country and where EU the union funding is at least 30% funding per project. Together with this, member states can grant aid, again, up to the same aid intensities that are allowed under Horizon Europe under the specific project call. And all public funding together, EU funding, member state funding from any regional or local or central resource can be granted up to the most favorable end intensity that is allowed for the project call under Horizon Europe. So this is again another, another area where there is a better possibility, easier granting of state aid to co-fund Horizon Europe. We hope that uh, the amended block exchange regulation with all these rules that we have explained now in the past few slides uh, will enter into force in July. Uh, it is just awaiting adoption now. And uh, we switch on to the next slide, please. Uh, now let's do a little excursion, uh, uh, just a very quick one, because we're over time into another instrument that can benefit uh, synergies. This is um, the use of state aid together with the InvestEU fund. The InvestEU fund provides guarantees to support financing and investment operations to address specific market failures inter alia in research and development and innovation investments. However, where member states contribute their resources through implementing partners like national banks, national promotional banks, or other funding authorities together with InvestEU, state aid is obviously involved because it's on funds under member state control. Again, forthcoming block exemption regulation, again, easier rules, for instance, for research and development projects. So together with InvestEU, member states can provide state aid and for R&D projects up to 75 million per beneficiary if the aid is granted directly by the National Promotional Bank together with InvestEU or up to 30 million euro per SME if it is for digitization or innovation project. If the InvestEU financing is granted together with uh, public state aid resources through an int financial intermediary, a commercial bank, for instance, then the uh, aid amount is reduced in order to limit the side advantages to this financial intermediary. So again, InvestEU as another instrument that, ben that will benefit from uh, synergies. And uh, we go to the next slide, um, please. Um, this is, I quickly conclude, 
the key advantage from all these rules that we've just explained, the standard rules is there is no formal stated notification procedures. Member states can go ahead granting the aid without having to wait for commission authorization. It is automatically authorized because it is in line with the future general block exemption regulation. Member states have to see to that this aid for all these synergy areas, seals of excellence, co-funded projects under partnerships, teaming actions, or invest EU funded R&D is in line with these conditions. And then they can go ahead with the aid. So this is the major advantage. And uh, with this, I conclude with uh, explaining a standard part and then uh, hand over to the next speaker. And also thank you, Peter. Uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, I'll keep it short. Time is running. Um, just, uh, just to remember um, that we have been talking a lot about uh, different uh, synergy instruments now, but of course it's also very important um, to to keep in mind other um, uh, opportunities that are maybe uh, less difficult in terms of provisions, but um, but uh, very important in terms of synergy. So the possibility to to achieve upstream, downstream, parallel synergies. Um, uh, support um, uh, measures to fund uh, by, for example, cohesion policy to support um, universities, research centers, companies to, to um, successfully participate in Horizon Europe, training, RNI skills, incubators, capacity building, all these measures, then downstream synergies um, for projects, Horizon projects that cannot arrive to the market with Horizon support alone. Uh, where Horizon does not reach a higher TRL level, for example. So there, um, this could be then uh, taken up by, by cohesion policy funds and also follow up research, for example, by applied research through cohesion policy funds. Uh, there's dissemination exploitation tools available, Horizon results platform, matchmaking tools. Um, and then, of course, also parallel synergies um, investment um, into um, areas uh, that uh, take place in parallel um, but with the same objective for example in the area of missions that could be relevant um, last slide please very briefly uh, just to conclude um, now is, is really the time to, to contact to get in contact um, with the managing authorities of the cohesion policy program uh, to be part of, of the programming, also of the implementation of the new programs. Uh, as I mentioned, economic social partners, including free research and innovation, they need to be included. Um, uh, and, um, and, uh, and then also just to see with the authorities to what extent you can make use of the funding available for your purpose, um, but also to see if there are any synergy tools completely available in the regional program uh, in which you're located. So there's get in touch with the managing authorities. There's a lot of information, also contact details on, on current programs available on the websites um, of um, DG Employment, DG Video. And with this, I will close this part and I will hand over to my colleague, uh, Crispin Weymouth from DG Grow, who will um, uh, continue on the single market program. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, but yeah, thanks very much. Uh, well, colleagues, what I want, uh, everyone, good morning. What I'd like to do today is to take the single market program and to kind of funnel down into what I think it means for individual companies and obviously the synergies and the complementarities we see with the work that's being done in Horizon Europe. And, you know, as you've just heard, obviously, with the regional funds uh, and as we'll hear here later with Digital Europe. So if we can have the next slide, please. Just to kind of give you a general overview of the single market program, it's, it's the uh, successor to a number of uh, individual programs that we had under the last multi-annual financial framework. But in particular, the thing in the red, which is the COSME program, the Competitiveness of Small and Medium-Sized Enterprises program. Uh, and its focus, as you can imagine from the title, is to improve the functioning of the single market program uh, by lumping together a number of actions, uh, including, by the way, and we've seen uh, the, the importance of that, the food chain, consumers and end users, standardization, uh, and also making sure that we have proper statistics. And obviously that means Eurostat. The next slide, please. It has a relatively small budget. It's 4.2 billion, 
and the uh, bulk of that is taken up by two elements. The first is the food chain, uh, but the second, and I think of more interest to you, is a billion uh, has been set aside for the uh, competitiveness of enterprises programs. And within that, we have uh, what we're trying to do. In fact, if we can have the next slide, please. Is we now have a number of specific objectives here. And this is we're taking on from the tremendous success that we had under the COSME program. And that's basically six things. We, with an overall objective of strengthening the competitiveness and sustainability of SMEs. So it goes in tandem with our SME strategy that we adopted in March last year, just before the crisis broke. Firstly, uh, and I will come on to this uh, and focus on this, dedicated support to SMEs, clusters, other business network organizations, including in the tourism sector, which obviously is extremely important right now, given the crisis. We're trying to foster the growth, scale up and creation of SMEs. So that's, that's the, the core. But as part of that, it's helping them with access to, to, to markets, both within the single market and in third countries including obviously now the UK. It's about focusing on entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial skills. One of the, the programs in it uh, that I'm responsible for is the Erasmus for Young Entrepreneurs program that allows new entrepreneurs or people who are looking to, to have a, a shot at entrepreneurship to travel to another member state or increasingly globally to spend up to six months with an entrepreneur, with a more experienced entrepreneur in another country and really understand, work together on a common project. Uh, second, the, the, the fourth element is, and this is a bit more intangible, is creating a, phys, a favorable business environment for SMEs, supporting digital trans, transformation. So it's in partnership with Digital Europe that we will hear about in a minute, including social economy enterprises. So we're looking at how we can provide advice. Very important to us in the light of the recent industrial strategy update, there's an element of supporting the competitiveness of, ind of industrial ecosystems and sectors. And then above all, and this is really in line with our main industrial policy objectives of supporting the modernization of industry and what we call the triple transition towards a green digital and resilient economy. And I can put that to you in five words, really. It's bouncing back from the crisis. It's helping our entrepreneurs and our smaller companies to come back strong from the crisis and to be the world leaders of tomorrow. Now, if I can have the next slide, please. I want to talk about two specific programs that I think are of particular interest to you and where we have particular salient complementarities with Horizon Europe. The first is the Enterprise Europe Network. It is the world's largest support network for SMEs. And it is what we're trying to do is to bring together organizations that exist at local level in the member states uh, and at regional level uh, and, and get them to work together. So we're talking chambers of commerce, innovation agencies, regional development agencies, universities, research institutes. We don't specify what we say, and we've got a call open for the next network that will start on the 1st of January next year, is we just say, here's a bunch of objectives that we would like you to meet. Come together in a consortium at either regional or national level, depending on the size of, of, of the country and of the economy, and provide these services. Show how you're gonna provide these services. We had a, a, a very useful information day uh, last week. And if anyone has any information, has any questions, I'm happy to, to forward a link to uh, the presentation that we gave there. And what we're doing there is helping ambitious European businesses to innovate, to increase their competitiveness and expand their business in Europe and beyond. We're not looking at, at, at supporting all types of SMEs. What we're looking about is those who really say, look, now I want, to, I want to grow within the single market and beyond, and helping them to be ready to do that by supporting them in their innovation. And I'll talk a few words about the, the way that we're doing that. Important thing for you to know, these services are completely free of charge. They're not in competition with consultancies. Uh, what we're trying to do is build on the support, as I said, that's happening at local level. 
and but connect up people across Europe so that they can support partnership with each other. And all EN services must have a European dimension and provide EU value added to clients. So this is why the funding that we provide is not one-off, it is a top-up on existing uh, support that is being provided. Next slide, please. Just to kind of break this down into what that support does in practice. Firstly, there is about information. It is uh, supporting SMEs who are maybe looking to expand in the single market and want to understand the rules. And we're doing that in partnership with networks such as the Single Digital Gateway. We are trying to support ambitious companies knowing their way through, through the rules and being aware of the opportunities. Secondly, and this is really the core of the service, is a dedicated advice that they provide to an SME that comes to them and they carry out what we call an intake assessment and they say, look, you want to expand, these are your needs. Maybe you need to work on your management structure, maybe you need to work on, you need to innovate in the way that you're operating, maybe you need to find partners, try and work out what it is. And where necessary, this is the, the third pebble in this bond, is capacity building, dedicated training to them where they need it or where the network can't provide it, saying to them, look, maybe talk to a consultant about this or maybe develop this further. Critically, you will see innovation support. And this is really an absolutely essential element. What we're trying to do in complementarity, and we did it with Horizon 2020 uh, and now with Horizon Europe, is to give them support of accessing finance, but also making use of that finance when they get it, uh, and giving them dedicated advice uh, about how they can innovate successfully. We're also, as I said, looking at access to finance, including increasingly green finance. And we're helping them to connect up with partners in, a, in other member states or indeed in third countries. And above all, we're trying to give them opportunities, including public procurement opportunities, let them know where there are spaces to, go, to grow, including helping them take part in dedicated matchmaking or connections with investors. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Great. And what we've done under the next network that we're putting in place as of next year is an upgraded thing. We had a thorough root and branch look at how we could internally make the network perform better and, in, and ensure uniformly high standards across the network we call it the EN vision. Uh, but on top of that, we've added four new elements. Firstly, we're cooperating very closely with our colleagues, and I'll talk about clusters for a second, uh, in the European Cluster Collaboration Platform, but also with the European Digital Innovation Hubs to provide a seamless service for SMEs looking to digitalize, whether they be the very advanced, to those who, who realize, and obviously in the light of this crisis, most companies have, that they need to raise their game. A second element is we help them to get the benefits of free trade agreements. We help to give them dedicated advice about how, they, how to ensure their rights when they're operating in third countries with whom the EU has free trade agreements. The third element, and this was really a key element in our SME strategy last year, is we're putting in place dedicated sustainability advisors to give SMEs the advice they need about how they improve their resource efficiency, how they improve their waste management, how they uh, improve their circularity, but also on the social aspects of sustainability, how they ensure gender equality, how they, uh, ensure, how they, they look at a fair workplace, how they engage in their communities. And a new element you'll see in red that we announced uh, just a few weeks ago in the industrial strategy update is in the light of the crisis, we are uh, stepping up, we are, working together with clusters so that we can help them identify their vulnerabilities and address any supply chain disruptions in the event of a crisis. Next slide, please. The second element that I think is really useful to you is what we do in the European Clusters Network. It's a bunch of initiatives, but at the heart of it is what we call the European Cluster Collaboration Platform. It's allowing uh, the individual clusters of industries uh, to, to collaborate together to seek opportunities to work together to find partnerships. We're also promoting a number of partnerships through the cluster exchange pilot. We have a dedicated database in the European Resource Efficiency Knowledge Center. We keep an observatory to find out what's going on. And we have a number of international elements such as EUGO International. Uh, and then 
just before I conclude, to pass on to the next speaker, what is the, the, the benefit for, for you and the complementarity? Firstly, there's a lot of, uh, I mentioned the innovation element. And under Horizon 20, 2020, we provided uh, what we call enhanced innovation management capacity services. That's an audit of your innovation needs as a company. And now we're continuing this under the single market program. We also cooperate with national contact points for Horizon Europe. Uh, and obviously, there's a large overlap because we all have innovation agencies. And we work on ind individual projects where we can support SMEs. Tomorrow, my colleague, Isoline Roger Dalbert, will talk to you about the innovation, Innovate to Transform project. That's something that we're, we're, we're working on. Equally on clusters, we're supporting companies coming together so that you can make the, 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 the best use of the opportunities you're being provided. So with that, and I'm happy to take questions at the end, I pass over to Mathieu Delescluze to talk about the Digital Europe program. Uh, thank you, Crispin. Uh, thank you, and uh, good morning again, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to now present in a, in a few minutes uh, this new pro program of the EU. This Digital Europe is indeed the new kids on the block of EU funding programs. Um, it did not exist under our previous uh, multi-annual framework. And uh, the, the, over the next years, this program will focus on the deployment of strategic pan-European digital infrastructures and services, but also on the development of advanced digital skills and on the take-up of digital technologies by SMEs and the public administrations. So as you can understand, it will therefore be a central funding instrument to achieve the 2030 vision and objectives of the digital decade as it was set out in the communication in March this year. The Commission has proposed to set up a digital compass for 2030, which, like any compass, has four cardinal points that you see on these slides. Skills, infrastructures, digital info transformation of businesses, and digital transformation of the public sector. For each of these cardinal points, the Commission is proposing a number of uh, high-level targets to be reached uh, in 2030. The, these targets are for the EU mobile, as a whole, mobilizing the member states and the private sector. And obviously, Digital Europe uh, will make an important contribution to progressing to those targets. On the next slide, you see uh, where Digital Europe fits in, this, uh, in the portfolio of, of the main uh, funding programs. And you have, uh, been, you have heard already about several of them. Uh, it is important to understand uh, the main uh, distinguishing factor with Horizon Europe, which uh, is uh, also closely related, and we are, uh, that's why we are talking about today, uh, Digital Europe is not about uh, research and innovation. It is really about deploy deployment, the take-up of digital technologies, deployment of infrastructure, so the implementation at large of the more mature technologies, which uh, are uh, now uh, available for the market. So in real life, in real products, in real solutions. So for instance, uh, we, will, we will focus uh, the, the support on the delivery of actual results, uh, like the acquisition of high performance computing machines, the setup of sectorial data spaces, in particular, for instance, in the manufacturing sector, the building, uh, or the reinforcing of AI, artificial intelligence testing and experimentation facilities, the setup and delivery of master courses uh, on, on to, uh, in key advanced digital technologies, the setup, interoperability and operations of a number of services in the e-government area. So you see, it's really about buying things, about making things work uh, based on, on digital technologies, which are mature, which can be deployed and used, use of procurement, not only grants uh, in the Digital Euro program, and really to build the strategic capacities of the EU in the areas that we will uh, go uh, in a minute, so in the area of computing, data, uh, AI, and, and skills, and, deploy and uh, diffusion. The next slide. Uh, so in what uh, areas are we going to focus our effort in terms of deployment of strategic capacities? So this is uh, summarized here in the structure of the program. Uh, first of all, the high performance, high performance computing, where again, 
uh, the, the focus will be on deploying and buying machines rather than performing research innovation, which will be done uh, under um, uh, the uh, UHPC uh, joint undertaking in, in the research innovation actions. Uh, it's about uh, uh, testing and experimental facilities in interli intelligence artificial, artificial intelligence, sorry, um, and, and the deployment also of an AI platform and or the deployment of uh, common data, data spaces in a number of uh, sectoral areas. Then there is an important deployment of cybersecurity uh, solutions as well. And as I said, a fourth pillar, which is about advanced dig digital skills. I would like to insist on the, the term advanced because here the, the master courses that will be developed and all the actions to support also training and, uh, and the development of, of skills in Europe will really focus on the advanced advanced uh, side of it and not the basic digital skills, which, which will not be in scope of, of, of the program. And then the cross-cutting uh, pillar, the fifth uh, specific objective, if you will, of this program is uh, what you see in the blue arrows, uh, which is about the really the diffusion of uh, digital solution and solutions and technologies across the economy, uh, both in uh, across uh, uh, SMEs, but also in public administration. So these are cross-cutting actions. It's not focusing on specific infrastructure deployment, but really about helping SMEs to uh, to find out what the digital solution can best fit their business, develop their business, uh, lower their uh, logistics, their, their costs, uh, and, 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 and allow them to gain uh, further uh, markets and further uh, customers. And for that, there will be, uh, we'll not go into the detail today, but there will be a very important network of European digital innovation hubs that will provide services locally to the SMEs and that will be in a network that will allow them to put uh, any SMEs around them in contact with the right hubs, with the right uh, specialty, with the right expertise, if the expertise, uh, the specific ex expertise uh, found or uh, looked for by the SME is not available in the local hub. So it's a, it's a very important um, uh, network that is uh, that has already started to be in place in H2020, which, that, which will be developed further and put in a network uh, under uh, Digital Europe uh, at the beginning of, of the program. On the next slide, we, you see a, a, um, a breakdown of the budget, uh, important, of course, on all of these actions, uh, all of these pillars. Uh, in total, Digital Europe will, be, uh, will have a, a bit more than uh, 7.5 billion uh, uh, euro over the seven years, but it is financing half of the cost, so it should leverage the double of this, so 15, around 15 billion euro. Uh, and this is broken down, as you see, in the three main uh, specific objectives, high performance computing, 2.2 billion, artificial intelligence, cloud and data, 2 billion, uh, um, uh, cybersecurity, 1.6, and then uh, the two objectives which are more cross-cutting on skills, half a million, and uh, deployment uh, uh, of, of digital technologies, uh, one, one billion. On the next slide, it's a summary of what you know, are the main outcomes we expect from the various parts of, of the programs, from the various actions uh, that will be undertaken. So again, on high-performance computing, it's about procuring exascale machines, upgrading existing supercomputers, uh, putting in place the first really quantum computing uh, machines uh, and also uh, widening the access to those uh, supercomputing facilities. On AI, uh, the common data spaces in the various, uh, in various sectors, uh, large testing and experimentation facilities, and uh, a, a European AI platform to access uh, tested AI technologies. On the cybersecurity, you see the cybersecurity shield, quantum communication infrastructure will have also its first deployment under uh, Digital Europe, uh, the, uh, the certification schemes and the cybersecurity tools. And in terms of skills, again, master courses, really uh, job placements, uh, short-term trainings, but in the advanced area of digital, not, not really the, the basic. Uh, skills which will be covered by, by by other supporting schemes. And then on the deployment side, again, the uh, um, innovation hubs are a very important uh, element of this deployment uh, objective, but you also have some uh, concrete 
um, uh, um, uh, um, um, projects with Destination Earth, which is a digital twin of the Earth, uh, modeling the uh, various uh, elements that 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 um, that will allow us to better understand and and, and anticipate the climate uh, evolution. Uh, digital twins also for smart communities, blockchain infrastructure also an important one, which is uh, which will which will be uh, developed hopefully across uh, several member states and enhancing the, the confidence in the digital transformation. Last, uh, few, last uh, slide for a few words in, in, in concrete terms uh, regarding the implementation of the program. Uh, you will be relatively familiar with the way it works if you want to also uh, see what is uh, interesting for you in that program, because it will be based uh, on, a, on a work program uh, for two years. I mean, the, 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 like, like in Horizon, uh, the work program will uh, define the objectives, the scope, the expected outcome of the actions. Uh, and and um, and uh, if there is any restriction to participation, the call text will be published at the call opening and will define all the technical details. So here it's uh, something you already know under the Horizon Europe in terms of mechanics. And then the funding schemes will be a bit different, um, similar but not exactly the same because the grants will cover only 50%. Uh, of the cost, uh, it's as, as we said, it's a deployment uh, program. So uh, the, the beneficiaries will also have to <clears throat> to cover half of the cost. Uh, for SMEs, uh, the rate could could go until uh, seventy five percent of reimbursement. Uh, the co some of the there, there will be some coordination and support action as well. So those will be covered at one hundred percent, like like in Horizon, and then there is there is a possibility for co-funding by member states in some of these uh, areas. So in particular, in the case of the testing and experimentation facilities, in terms of timeline, uh, the Digital Europe uh, first work program is right now being finalized. Uh, we are hoping that uh, it should be adopted relatively quickly after uh, summer, and then the first calls will be uh, issued. Um, uh, also uh, at the beginning of, of, of the autumn, hopefully. That's the plan. And, uh, and uh, we hope that um, you, will, you will find also maybe interesting actions under those, uh, this first program where you, you could bring uh, your, your expertise. Thank you very much. Now we can give the floor to Max Jungquist, who is going to uh, uh, introduce the space program. Max. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, a few words uh, about the EU space program and the synergies with that. And, uh, and uh, I have some further additional comments as well. We can take next slide. Uh, my name is Max Jungquist. I work in DG DEFIS, uh, Defense Industries and Space. And uh, DEFIS is also running the EU space program, which is adopted for the period 21 27. Um, it is a continuation of, uh, of the, partially at least, a continuation of the two previous programs, EGNSS, so Galileo EGNOS satellite navigation, and Copernicus Earth observation from the previous uh, uh, funding period, with the addition of two new systems. Uh, uh, situational, space Situational Awareness, SSA, that includes um, space surveillance and tracking, uh, near-Earth objects, asteroids uh, and similar, as well as, uh, as uh, now I forgot, no, uh, space weather, uh, space weather phenomena that could also provide, uh, uh, generate some problems with the space infrastructure and Earth infrastructure as well. So, um, and then the, the fourth component is governmental satellite communication. So secure communication for government agencies in, uh, in uh, emergency situation and crisis situations, et cetera. Um, the, uh, these uh, four components now uh, have a total budget of about 13 billion euro. Uh, Galileo is the largest one. You see there actually on the notes page, 8 billion for Galileo, 4.8 for Copernicus and about 400,000 uh, euro for, for uh, uh, SSA and GOPS.com. So um, uh, this is supported by a number of uh, kind of birth transversal activities, access to space, which is um, providing the launch opportunities for launching satellites into space, 
support to startup uh, activities and entrepreneurship and the security related aspects of these of these systems so how does this relate to horizon europe then well it is it is these are uh, certainly copernicus and galileo egnos are operational systems since quite a long time uh, previous slide still we should stay on the previous slide um, since quite a long time and the 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 operational program, the space program here, provides uh, funding for the actual operation of these programs, the continued operation of these programs, including the manufacturing and launch of new satellites into space, as well as the upgrades and, and the improvements that are needed. For, for those existing systems, Horizon Europe will provide uh, the research dimension that is necessary to uh, to develop the next generations of these systems and the new sensors for earth observation the new satellites for next generation galileo and so on for the new systems the funding in the space program eu space program is rather modest and therefore there is a combination here of horizon europe funding and and funding for for uh, from the space program where the space program takes care of the operational aspects where uh, certainly Space surveillance and tracking is an operational program. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we can say that it is uh, a European system to monitor uh, the orbit, the objects orbiting space, and in particular, then the space debris, space junk that uh, pro that poses risk for collision with uh, active satellites, and therefore needs to be monitored. And there need to be avoidance maneuvers to avoid collisions. Uh, so this this is a system which relies heavily on member states' assets, uh, radars, telescopes, and also, of course, uh, computing uh, capacity for uh, continuously updating the collision risks of all these objects, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of objects in, in orbit. Um, okay, so this, I think, covers the, the, the space program. Next slide will just outline a few additional aspects. Uh, I think it has been covered in some of the presentations already. We heard Digital Europe program. There are clearly uh, synergies also with space here, uh, with the connect to the, the digital part of cluster four that includes quantum communication. Uh, the space uh, part of, of cluster four also supports quantum and the specifically the space a segment of quantum communication systems, which is a crucial, uh, crucial part. Um, we also provide funding for in-orbit demonstration for a specific space mission of a, of a quantum satellite in collaboration with the European Space Agency, the Eagle One space mission. There are several partnerships. The space partnership, as we heard, is uh, planned, but not yet launched. The other partnerships on manufacturing, triple E components, the key digital uh, technologies made in Europe, uh, AI, data robotics, smart networks and services for telecom, all uh, have important links and synergies with the space, the corresponding space activities in these areas. And finally then, as a last point, Galileo, Egnos and Copernicus are operational systems. They provide services and data and are therefore a valuable asset in addressing challenges that are uh, that are funded in the different clusters of Horizon Europe, uh, be it uh, climate change uh, activities, environment monitoring, uh, smart mobility, etc. And the references to those Galileo, Egnos, Copernicus services and data are made uh, across the, the Horizon Europe program in these cases. Uh, that concludes my my intervention thank you thank you much and thanks to all the speakers for taking us over the uh, those interesting union programs that are complementary to cluster four the last uh, program we would like to bring to your attention is a european defense fund uh, however in this case we are not going to go into uh, any detail today because there will be a launch event tomorrow uh, and uh, we encourage those of you who are interested of course it uh, uh, it coincides with part of our own info days nevertheless uh, there will be information after that event 
Um, and now we are ready to, uh, to answer uh, as many of your questions uh, as we can. Uh, we have about half an hour, um, and I will try to group them according to the subject, and the various colleagues here uh, will try to, um, to answer them. So first of all, we can start with a group of questions on the seal of excellence, which Max can take. Max, the floor is yours. Um... Seal of Excellence, uh, I would hand over to Peter, um, frankly speaking. So it was more on the questions uh, 10, 11. Uh, yes, I, I beg your pardon. Yes. Um, uh, no worries. Indeed. So the, um, the these questions that Max can take are about uh, the uh, how can the um, synergies with other funds be addressed in a cluster four proposal? Uh, how would the transfer apply for co-founder partnerships uh, and uh, important projects of common European interest and also a question on how universities of applied sciences can enhance their success. Max, yeah, please. Thank you. So I think some, some are already answered by the ongoing slides um, after um, the question was, was posed. But um, yeah, on the uh, placement of synergies with other programs and also the cohesion fund it's uh, always depends on on as uh, already to told at the intro it depends on your strategy how you bring in um, other players other programs and how you um, how the maturity of your research is so um, and we, we are talking on different categories of synergies in terms of um, parallel or sequential, but it's not always um, a clear clear differentiation. So you sometimes also have an overlap and say, okay, you go into an into a application of a research project and can, um, in the category, for example, of an innovation action, very early address a go-to-market strategy as it was um, well, as it could be complemented by funds and also an ecosystem which is um, addressed by a single market program. When you, um, in other cases, uh, at a very at a early maturity and TRL, you have a more sequential synergy and take it up um, by, by another other program. So the intention is, is to be as concrete as possible in, in your application for the Horizon Europe application, but uh, not not more for exa uh, for for sure. So to address that, you have synergies in mind and say, okay, that's what we have to to prove and um, and check in the ongoing um, project development um, is also um, absolutely absolutely okay. That to say, okay, I have it taken into consideration. If you can be more concrete, then me you can address it earlier. So it's it's a question of maturity and a, uh, um, a question of the of the context um, of um, use and dissemination of the results, side ground and background IPR for sure. Um, then um, the transfer to co-funded partnerships. Yes, that was already uh, mentioned by Bernhard and Peter as well co-funded and institutionalized partnerships uh, for sure. Maria can can say some uh, some lines more on that uh, for sure. Uh, the question uh, on IPCEIs, energy intensive industries, uh, carbonization, uh, what I have in mind, so I have not, not a full list of upcoming IPCEIs, but the IPCEIs, um, in the hydrogen sectors are uh, really addressing uh, this issue. Maybe Jürgen Tietje um, is more aware of the IPCEIs in the uh, sector of energy intensive industries and can, can add on that. Uh, on the question of how universities of applied sciences can enhance uh, their success rate in getting the funding, do they have less chance than basic research universities? Um, I, I would not say so. And um, if I remember on the concept um, strategy first, um, funding second, then we have a very, very good positioning of uh, universities of applied science to be uh, the 
the uh, interlocutor between um, research, even basic research into the world of the SMEs and even startups. So um, to, to, to build the bridge and to transfer and going into direct applications. So it's uh, really a question of positioning um, to, to, to bring it into the ecosystem and cross fertilize between um, lower TRLs and um, an application and go, go to market strategies. So that's uh, from my side, and I would be very happy to, uh, if some colleagues want compliment on what I've said. Thank you very much, uh, Max. Uh, would Bernard take the question on state aid? Um, is it mandatory to apply for funding with state aid? Um, yeah, Peter, I'm happy. I'm happy to take that question. Um, well, it, it is certainly not. Um, granting state aid, first of all, on the principle, granting state aid for a project is a choice that member states can take. It's an option that they have. And it's also optional, of course, to apply for state aid. No, but in reality, or in, in practical operations, what happens is this. In seals of excellence, it is, well, the fact is that there is no funding from the union budget. So that is why the beneficiary who has received the seals of excellence has the option then to apply for state aid for his or her project. And the member states are free to publish calls for proposals to fund seals of excellence project with state aid. And then the beneficiary well, will know about that call and will be able to apply for state aid under that program. And that state aid is then can be granted in line with the forthcoming new easy uh, cheaper block exemption regulation, we call it cheaper block exemption regulation rules. So uh, this is then under seals of excellence, for instance, but there can be other configurations where the beneficiary wouldn't even know that state aid is involved. For example, under a co-funded co -fund, co European partnership, where the EU provides its funding to a group of member states who then implement a program, the beneficiary at the end of the line wouldn't even know that in the overall funding that he receives is a certain component of state that involved together with union funding. It is just for the beneficiary to know that there is he received public funding. It can be different, for instance, under an institutionalized partnership where uh, a member state has chosen to finance a project alongside a partnership, then the beneficiaries will probably be made aware of a program or would then know when to apply. But it's, it's certainly not mandatory from the point of view of stated rules. It is just that there's an option for member states to do this and there's an option for beneficiaries to elect or to, to apply for state aid. It really depends on how the member states implement a certain project. Sometimes beneficiaries wouldn't even know that that is involved. Sometimes they would know that there is, together with the EU, another parallel member state program that provides funding for a project. And uh, I hope that this answers the question and uh, I'll hand back uh, to Nicola. Thank you for this, uh, Bernhard. And uh, can I now ask uh, Peter uh, to take uh, some questions on the seal of uh, excellence, uh, and in particular, how does it work with multi-partner uh, proposals? Yes, um, uh, for the seal of excellence, um, uh, the, the legislation allows, in principle, um, is open to the question whether um, uh, uh, who can receive a seal of excellence. So in principle, it could be monobeneficiary grants, it could also be consortia. Um, but um, to look at um, what is uh, realistic, uh, we have to see um, what can the alternative funding sources support. So it, it, it doesn't make um, much sense to, uh, to award a seal of excellence if the seal holder will not have a realistic chance to get this alternative funding. So we have to look at the alternative funding source, in this case, cohesion policy um, in, in, 
And here we have to see what, what can they fund. So it has to be um, a project proposal that falls into the scope of the fund, into the has to um, uh, be aligned with the objectives of the program that gives the funding. And um, if it's an RNI project, uh, as uh, we have here in under Horizon, it has to be um, also um, fall within the smart specialization strategy of the relevant region. So, um, and typically, what they support is um, is mono beneficiary grants, um, uh, close to the market activities, um, and then uh, beneficiaries within the region. So within the territory of the of um, uh, that the program is covering, so we here we have to look what what are what are these you know horizon activities that that are well suited under these uh, conditions and and there we have I mean it's very clearly uh, if we look at the EIC accelerator the for, uh, successor to the SME instrument we have SMEs we have a, they are located in a specific territory they have activities. That um, that fall under the, uh, the scope of the of the fund, um, and uh, so this is something that is um, you know was was quite uh, easy to implement and and also attractive from the point of view of the cohesion policy authorities because it provides them with a pipeline of of excellent projects. Um, similar also for for um, for the MSCA and also for teaming in principle. Um, so the RC proof of concept, these kind of projects. For multi-beneficiary grants for consortia, as I mentioned, it's not excluded, but it's more complex. It would require that the managing authority is ready to fund um, uh, project partners outside of the territory. And to do this, um, uh, they would have to show that this is for the benefit of, um, of, uh, of the program, of, of the region. Um, which is, I mean, something that has not happened so far very often, but it's not, as I said, it's not excluded, but it is um, much more complex. The alternative would be that you would have different managing authorities, cohesion policy uh, managing authorities um, uh, um, from different regions. So from the regions in which the project partners in the consortia are located, and they would have to, um, you know, coordinate and um, and agree on uh, on supporting um, partners, the partners that are in the consortia, and they would have to, of course, have the same you know, uh, smart specialization priorities. Uh, the timing has to uh, be right, so it's it's a little bit more complex, I would say, but it's not, I'd say, excluded for the future. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Peter. Uh, let me now take uh, a group of questions uh, that are essentially uh, about one issue. How do you uh, demonstrate in a proposal to Horizon Europe plus the four uh, that you have synergies? And the answer is you do, you do not because the proposal uh, for Horizon Europe is a standalone proposal. It does not in itself depend on synergies. So you are not expected to, you do not have an advantage in the proposal. Um, uh, so we cannot ask for that. Uh, but of course, as, the, uh, as we explained, there are many benefits in, uh, uh, in uh, creating such synergies afterwards, during a project or after the project, but not at the proposal stage. So I hope that this answers that group of questions. Now, there were other questions uh, uh, um, asking for more information and links to the various programs that the uh, colleagues outlined, for example, the Enterprise Europe Network or the widening participation and spreading excellence uh, uh, part of the work program. So what we will do is we'll, uh, the links are, of course, at hand and we will add them to the slides so that uh, when we make them available once again, you will be uh, able uh, to follow that. In general, um, uh, you can go to the funding and tenders portal and uh, look for uh, a lot of those uh, opportunities. But I also, if I can say on the Enterprise Europe Network, it's also if you just put Enterprise Europe Network into your favorite search engine, uh, you will find the main page, you'll find the opportunities open to you in your region. You can contact the local contact point there if you're an SME. 
and look at, uh, you know, explain your situation. Or if you're thinking about uh, maybe becoming part of the next Enterprise Europe network, you're a, a regional development agency or an innovation agency or anyone else who thinks they can add value, really uh, welcome. There's also information there and it links through. If you go to the website of the European Innovation Council, Council and SMEs agency as mayor, you'll also see that they have a recording of the information day that we carried out last week uh, and all the presentations that we gave, which go into uh, really uh, an enormous a lot, uh, uh, amount of depth, uh, not, just, uh, we, not just five slides that I presented, but actually about 120 slides, so as much as you could wish for. Thank you, Crispin. Very useful. Um, and now there is a question on the Digital Europe uh, program. Can a, a Digital Europe funded project receive local public complementary funding? Mathieu, would you take that? Uh, yes. So, um, indeed, uh, for um, uh, testing and experimental faci experimentation facilities in AI, uh, there is uh, a national co-funding uh, mandatory, so the mem member states need to uh, co-fund uh, the actions there. And then for uh, um, the digital innovation hubs, uh, as well, uh, uh, the, the national funding is is, uh, is expected, and uh, the cohesion policy funds may be used also in that case. Uh, simply, uh, we have to find the right manner to avoid uh, uh, that it, it funds the same costs. So the way this um, can be implemented is uh, is, is to be uh, further uh, clarified and defined. Uh, but certainly, uh, if the costs are declared uh, in a way that uh, they are, there is no double uh, funding of the costs by uh, the cohesion uh, fund uh, and by Digital Europe, this is also uh, possible. Thank you, Mathieu. Um, and uh, I, I don't see other questions on, uh, uh, on synergies that uh, we haven't uh, dealt with. Uh, but uh, please correct me if I'm wrong and if there is any question that someone can answer. I do see some questions that are not on synergies, but on other uh, horizontal issues. And uh, I'll, I'll try to take uh, one of them, uh, two of them, in fact, two related ones um, uh, about international cooperation. Um, so what uh, uh, happens when a topic specifies international cooperation and but we can find the expertise within Europe? Well, uh, in all those topics uh, where international cooperation is encouraged, it's not compulsory. Um, but uh, of course, as in all topics, uh, the impact will be assessed. So it is up to the proposers to decide how best to address impact. Uh, and another point I could make, perhaps, is that in the case of international cooperation, you do not necessarily do it only to find uh, missing expertise. You may, in some cases, you may want to do it for other reasons, like to widen your markets. So that, too, is uh, relevant. Then there was another question about uh, the some topics um, in uh, destination two, mainly resilience which mentioned excluding industrial competitors from countries where the IPR safeguarding is not guaranteed. Well, that is not an eligibility condition. So uh, again, it is up to the proposers to demonstrate, uh, the, uh, to assess the risks and benefits of including such industrial competitors, uh, subject, of course, to the report that those topics uh, uh, referred to, and that will be uh, assessed in the evaluation under impact. But unlike uh, Article 22.5, uh, where that is applied, uh, it will, it, uh, this uh, formulation is not a strict, uh, an absolute eligibility condition. And now I'm looking for any other questions that we could uh, possibly answer. And uh, maybe uh, a colleague who sees one uh, that Nic we could. Nicolas, I have yes. uh, one. Um, there was a question, if I may take this one then. Uh, there was a question on ISEP, the InnoFin Space Equity Pilot. 
if it will be continued and in what program and it's uh, the answer was given in the question basically uh, the inopin space equity pilot was launched in horizon 2020 with the intention of continue that and it will continue in a similar form under invest eu so that's the place to go to look for for this uh, equity funding for space startups and space uh, growth companies thank you Thank you very much, Mats. And I see Bernhard can take uh, one more question. Bernhard, please. Yes, sir. Thank you. There was a question um, that raised the issue that uh, Belgian federal authorities uh, couldn't receive state aid for Seals of Excellence on the horizon 2020. And uh, the question is whether this, uh, whether this um, would change. Um, this is an interesting question. Uh, but first of all, it, it raises a fundamental thing. First of all, State aid for seeds of excellence projects is not regulated under Horizon Europe. It is subject to a completely different set of rules, namely state aid rules. Secondly, it is, <clears throat> as I said previously, the choice of the member state to grant aid for a seeds of excellence project to replace the union funding that was not available. So um, it seems that the Belgian authorities hadn't chosen <clears throat> to grant aid for these projects, which would have been perfectly possible even under the current existing non-amended block exemption regulation. However, under slightly more complex rules, slightly more complex rules. But then there's another fundamental thing. The question says that federal Belgian institutions could not receive state aid. So here my fundamental question is, would even these federal authorities be subject to stated rules because state aid is only or public funding for member states is only subject to stated rules if the beneficiary is an undertaking meaning a commercial undertaking so that the public funding could distort competition so that is why the stated rules are for to limit this public funding so as not to distort competition over much but uh, is that if uh, I see the question rather um, involves uh, federal institutions. So maybe these institutions, like a university, for instance, or another public authority, is not even an undertaking. I would presume so. So the public funding for the project of such entity is not even subject to standard rules. So I would I would rather invite uh, um, uh, the, the, uh, the the person who asked this question rather to check back if this really would be a state aid in the first place. Thank you very much. I couldn't answer the question. It's, it's all I can say to answer this question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bernhard. Um, now, I believe that, that we have done our best to answer most of the questions. Um, uh, and I would like to thank all the colleagues who participated in this presentation for the very rich presentations and the uh, uh, information they gave us, which uh, we hope will be useful to proposers. Uh, naturally, not all proposers or consortia will be interested in all possible synergies. Nevertheless, we hope that as many of you as possible will look into that and will be able to capitalize on uh, this very rich, uh, fertile landscape. Um, and with this, I think we can close this session. Uh, there will be further opportunities uh, to, for you to uh, uh, ask questions, to engage and to ask questions, for example, with the help of the national contact points. Uh, and as other colleagues said, we are always uh, here to help you with particular uh, problems. Thank you very much indeed. Goodbye.